and we'll have all that available as well. But for no uh, more delay in time here, uh, I do want to thank all of our panelists and of course Todd, um, Todd Wright for joining us today. Todd has been in, in involved with St. Mike's with the Adventure Sports Center as it's known now, formerly the Wilderness Program for almost 25 years. That'll be next year, um, his 25th wow. anniversary with the program. Um, but we're really excited to have him here today to moderate our first part of our panel. Um, and I'll hand it over to him and about a half hour from now, we'll be dividing up into those breakout rooms, focus on ski and snowboard industry and then one on travel and tourism. So Todd? Uh, thank you, Jacob. I appreciate it. Um, so welcome, everybody. I'd like us to get going by quickly going around uh, our Zoom meeting and uh, having everybody introduce themselves. And I think the easiest way to do this is if I just kind of announce people based on my screen. Does that make sense, Jacob? Cool. Because I'm, I'm sure we're all in different orders. So immediately to my right is Kate Anderson. Go ahead, Kate. Oh boy, first up. Um, <laughs> thanks, Todd. So my name is Kate Anderson. I am a uh, class of 2014, um, and I am the senior manager of sports and athletes for the U.S. ski and snowboard team. And I live and work in Park City, Utah. Cool. And to Kate's right is Kelly, but it's Kelly's iPad, so Kelly will have to give us her last name. I don't think it's iPad. I know, I'm so computer illiterate. My name is Kelly Matthews. I am class of 98. Um, currently, I live in Maine and Belfast, which is a little seacoast town halfway up, and I own a bed and breakfast, um, amongst other things, but that is uh, an endeavor that I started four years ago, and it was highly successful before COVID ruined everything. <laughs> so thank you for having me tonight, and thank you, Jason and Emily, for putting this together. And Kelly's right is uh, Brendan Oates, lovingly referred to as Boats, um, his email handle at St. Michael's College. Go ahead, Brendan. Hey, uh, I'm Brendan or Boats. Uh, I am currently at Grand Canyon National Park, where I work for the National Park Service, and I am a backcountry ranger, so I'm usually at the bottom for about a week at a time. But it worked out today where I'm back on the rim. So, yeah. And to Brendan's right is Al Kenworthy. Hey guys, uh, Al Kenworthy here, class of 2013. Um, I was a business major with a focus in marketing and now I'm the director of sales membership at Ski Utah. And I live in Park City and work in Salt Lake City. Uh, and to Al's right is uh, Julianne. Julianne, easy. We're not hearing you, Julianne. The old mute. <clears throat> Still not yet. So I'm going to uh, let Julianne get her text sorted. I'm going to move to Julianne's right, and then we'll pip on back to her. Um, so maybe, J Jacob, you could help her get her text sorted. Uh, to Julianne's right is Dan Sullivan. I'll unmute myself. So, boy, that's the first time in a Zoom meeting the whole time that there's been any technical problems. I mean, only joke. So I'm Dan Sullivan, aka Sully. I seem to be the elder statesman here, class of 87. Um, so I am currently the international director of sales for Rome Snowboards which I helped launch that brand. And I also helped launch um, original sit and snowboards in the 1990s um, with a few other St. Mike's people. So I currently live in Waitsfield, Vermont, and the offices are in Waterbury. So I've been in the uh, snowboard biz um, pretty much since probably two years after graduating. So 30, 30 years in the snowboard business. But first pandemic. <laughs> to uh, Dan's right is Angela Irving. 
Hi, I'm uh, Angela. I work for St. Mike's. I do grants and sponsored programs. Um, I'm a 2005 um, met, uh, graduate program in the um, CAMS program, which is Advanced Management Sciences. Um, so I'm here to support my colleagues in the alumni office because I work closely with them, but I also um, run a national program called Little Bellas, which is a national mountain biking mentoring program. Um, I see some nodding heads from Park City. We have a program up there. Um, we, we're in 17 states. Um, Sully's on our board, so we've known each other a long time. Um, and uh, COVID uh, hit summer programming and kids programming is pretty hard. Um, we've had an interesting summer. We were able to run some programs, which was amazing. Um, so I'm interested in hearing what's going on with other sports and to learn some more about travel and tourism as we, um, we're anticipating growing our program some more next year. So we're not slowing down. So thanks for having me and thanks for coming for, to our alumni and our staff. It's great to see you. Well, and to the right of Angela is Michelle Peoples. Hi, I'm a uh, class of 1991 and live in Underhill, Vermont. Um, I'm interested because I'm the business manager at Height of Land Publications in Jeffersonville, um, which publishes Backcountry Magazine, Mountain Flyer, Cross Country Skier, and uh, Alpinist Magazine. So just curious to hear what you guys have to say. And to the right of Michelle is Matt Salicki. Hey everybody, um, I graduated in 2011, um, used to work in the admission office at St. Mike's, um, transitioned to uh, Washington DC about a year ago. Uh, I do event planning for American University. Uh, so I'm just genuinely interested in what your perspectives are on tourism travel and what's all happening out there. Great to see everybody. And uh, to Matt's right, uh, Jules has been able to call in, so she's able to adapt and overcome. So uh, Jules, do you want to introduce yourself? Maybe not. So I'm going to go to Emily. Emily. Hi guys, I'm Emily. I'm a 2016 grad. I work with Jake in the alumni office. Um, alumni panels are our brainchild, so we're really excited that you guys are all here and a huge thank you to our panelists. And the last person is uh, Jules. No sound yet, maybe. I saw a great t-shirt the other day that okay. said, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, so well, well, we'll get going as Jules continues to figure out her tech. Um, so welcome everybody and uh, like Jacob said, I'm Todd Johnson Wright. I'm Director of Venture Sport at St. Mike's. I've been there for a very long time, uh, but outside of my work at St. Michael's College, I uh, do a lot of consulting with Venture Sport, um, and I do both uh, Venture Sport coach development and traditional sport coach development. So um, this COVID time has been incredibly interesting from an industry standpoint um, as a consultant also, and also as someone that works at the college. So just to get going with some questions, um, We'll start off with, uh, for our panelists, what are, what really drew you to your industry? Like what uh, connected you to uh, travel, tourism, um, et cetera? So what kind of connected you with this industry? And anybody can just uh, chime in by unmuting. So this was actually an, an accident for me. Um, I, I was an art major and I was an art teacher for many years and I've had a, a few different uh, um, jobs. And currently I'm also a nationally certified 
surgical technologist. And I was going to come north. My, I'm from Maine, and my parents actually live just up the road from me. And um, I was going to do that full time up here. And through long story short, personal reasons, this is actually plan B. I, I don't work full time as a surgical technologist. I don't work full time as the innkeeper either, because we have a very short season here. We don't have skiing nearby. We're a coastal town. And I've always been drawn to. Um, servicing people uh, in various ways. I was part of fire rescue for many years. Um, well, actually not many years, I was only there for two years uh, at the college I transferred in, but I became uh, an EMT after that. And I've always liked taking care of people. And I say, I like taking care of people on a short-term basis. <laughs> so it's like, please come in, I will feed you. I will make you happy. Um, come into the OR, I will help take care of you and then make you better and then go on your way. So this was actually something that came out of the blue. And like you said, you know, adapt and overcome. This is something that was a, not even a valid idea at the time and we made it happen. So it's, it's interesting just how life throws you curveballs and you say, well, what can I do with this? Cool. Does anybody else uh, care to answer that question? What drew you to, I mean, we have a diverse group of panelists, folks that work in the ski injuries on both sides of the industry. We have someone that works in the National Park System. Um, you know, what drew you to this work? Um, I'll jump in. I have always been really interested in, in sport. So I kind of ended up in the ski industry, not I don't want to say not on purpose, but not on purpose. Um, for me, it was more get into the sports world. Um, and how and my first in was within the U.S. ski and snowboard team. Um, and I ended up you know, falling in love with it. Um, you know, obviously, it's a huge part of the culture at St. Mike's, um, Shred MC, uh, which I was actually not super involved in when I was on campus. Um, and I'm from Minnesota. I didn't, like, grow up skiing. Um, so... Yeah, I kind of, it's a happy accident that I fell into the ski industry and I'm so glad I did because um, I, I just love it and I really don't see myself leaving at any point in the near future. Um, and it is actually such a small world. There's so many people that, you know, were like big names on campus for Shred MC that like now my athletes, they're like, oh yeah, I know that guy or, or whatever. So it's actually been really cool how um, the ski and snowboard culture at St. Mike's has actually helped me kind of get in with with other people out here for sure um so yeah i i fell into it by accident but i ended up loving it that's actually a pretty interesting point kate that, that and i've been at the college for long enough to realize that for a really small place we have an incredibly long reach um and when you bump into people all around the world that uh have some connection to st michael's college or vermont it's, it's pretty amazing so I'm feeling super positive now because Jules looks like she's now connected with an iPhone. She's smiling so she can hear us, but can we hear her? We still can't hear you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to keep trying. I, I really love Jules' dedication, desire, and effort. Um, she's not going to give up. We'll get to her at some point. So uh, anybody else from the team? Do other folks have any input on how they ended up getting connected uh, to this industry. Sure, I can chat a little bit. <clears throat> so, 1980s, you know, when I came up to the college, it was, it was because of my love of the mountains. I grew up, well, outside Boston, but then went to high school in New Hampshire. So when I went to St. Mike's, it was, where am I gonna get my pass, right? Um, and then from there, right as I was, Coming to the college in 1983, snowboarding was just starting to happen, and uh, I think it was December of 1983, so my freshman year, I went down to the downhill edge and saw a snowboard. I had seen an um, article in Powder Magazine, I think it was probably like the spring of 1982, and they had a whole feature on Winter Stick, and they had pictures of guys snowboarding, funny enough, at Alta. And uh, so I saw that article. And when I saw the boards in December, when I saw that snowboard, I said to my mother, maybe I can get that for Christmas. And that's what I got. And 
for the next four years at St. Mike's, it wasn't allowed yet at the ski areas, but I actually learned how to snowboard at the runway at the end of the airport. So we used to go across the street over the river where the quarries are. And at the time before they expanded the airport, you could actually do, you'd make about four turns before you hit the road down there. So we had a crew of probably five of us that hiked every time sugar bush for our season pass we hiked every mountain every field that you could see on route two all the way down and uh i just fell in love with it and i graduated with a business degree and i said if i have a business degree and this could be a business in time so i um so i went and became the first snowboard instructor at cannon mountain in new hampshire and um, Burton at the time was in Manchester, Vermont, and I went up, they had just moved to Burlington, and I came up to interview for a position, they had just opened their store up, and um, Emmett Manning, who's another St. Michaelite who works at Burlington, I had an interview with him, and as I was walking, we have an iPhone. As I was walking down Church Street after that interview, I bumped into my roommate, David Provost from St. Michael's, and he was working at Enastar at the time. And he said, your timing is good. We're gonna start a snowboard brand. You should talk to this person. So from that Saturday, I was hired on Monday. And that now has led to 30 years in the snowboard industry. So it was total, total connection of St. Mike's, and then that path of, Everywhere you go, somebody, somebody went to St. Mike. So. That's awesome. Um, so we have a, a variety of questions that, that people have already started asking. So I'm just going to uh, just pop along with a couple of other ones. And I think this is one that we all, everyone on this call can connect with is uh, how is your company and I'll, sub in industry there adjusted to the new demands of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I could speak this a little bit to this a little bit because I've been working with a variety of national bodies on um, how to do delivery within the context of a global pandemic. Um, and I can tell you that uh, it is it has changed everything. It has completely changed the landscape. But at the same time, um, I've seen people really uh, get innovative. Um, and I think that we're gonna see some, probably some positive long-term changes um, from the things that we were kind of forced to rethink. So for everybody else in the group, um, how has the global pandemic, um, how has your company or industry adjusted to the global pandemic? Um, I'll jump in here. Um, so probably pretty similar for a lot of you. Um, right away back in March when things kicked off with COVID, um, we all started working from home um, and living life on Zoom. And for me and my role, I'm responsible for holding all of our events for our membership program. So typically we'll hold them uh, on mountain or somewhere in the area where there's an outdoor activity. But uh, with that being a little bit tricky with coordinating with the resorts, a lot of our events have been moved to Zoom. Um, we have been able to hold smaller events, um, just outdoors, smaller groups. Um, and really for us in our industry and promoting the resorts, um, for us it's been basically following their uh, path and any new um, recommendations, protocols that they're putting in play for their summer operations, we've been trying to do our best in terms of pushing that out through our content, through social, through blog posts, just educating anyone who gets out there. So um, typically we will promote, you know, summer concerts or something fun like that, group events that the resorts put on, but that's totally shifted. So now it's more of an educational standpoint and uh, just trying to keep people safe, but allow them to still have fun at the resorts. So um, kind of a little difficult, but uh, it's something we can do and get out there and get people excited still. I can jump in a little bit from, so <clears throat> on the wholesale supply chain of the snowboard side, and I'm sure ski is similar, you know, the pandemic happened just as we were finalizing our 
preseason bookings because March, middle of March is usually the shutoff date for us to take orders. So we had no sooner just gotten our last orders, placed our orders with our suppliers so that product could be built and then the pandemic hit. So it, it was not an immediate issue that after that point in March, it typically becomes a slower time of year. We just sort of, even we're, we're building product, um, but there was just a ton of speculation as to what would happen at that point. You know, <clears throat> our sales reps that work for us, a lot of them work for summer lines as well. And at that point, they didn't know what was going to happen with the bike industry. The word was bike industry is going to be off 30%. All these things are going to be off because of COVID. Well, quickly, we found out that that happened for about a month. And then we, we saw our counterparts in other industries just start to go gangbusters. So we saw all the bike suppliers go, skateboard, everything, camping, anything to do with outside really started to boom. Um, so... We, we now are in a phase where we did have some cancellations. Some of our biggest suppliers, um, Vail Resorts is a large supplier and host for ski areas. And they started with canceling orders for like all hard goods. So that was a tough one. That was in May. Um, and then we, we, we didn't know if that was the start of a steady stream of cancellation. But then I think the confidence gained with some in the retail arena. So we, we didn't see a lot of cancellations and right now we're at the threshold of just starting to ship. So there's still a lot of speculation as to what can happen, but from our friends at like Ski Utah, it's nice that mountains started to prove the fact that they are going to be open. And with that, we expect to be um, quite busy. I will note though that certain trends in our industry, such as purchasing online, um, you know, unfortunately for some, fortunate for others, I guess, if they're in the digital space, we're seeing probably a five year acceleration of what was inevitably gonna happen anyway, right? So I think we're seeing those stores that were just getting by doing traditional brick and mortar sales are probably gonna be in a tough space, um, whereas, online people now just have the convenience um, accelerated. So the expectation is, is a lot of wholesale suppliers are probably gonna up the ante with their digital presence in their um, ability to go direct to consumer, which was a trend anyway, but it's accelerated. So that kind of leads us naturally to uh, the next question is, um, <clears throat> what are some insights that your company or industry or that your company has gained or that you've gained through your industry kind of in the light of uh, COVID-19? So um, like Dan was speaking to one very clearly is that this is now accelerated an inevitable trend that moving more to a digital space versus a brick and mortar space, but in other industries um, or in other uh, companies, um, what are some of those? Uh, what are some of those uh, insights that you may that you may have connected with? Um, I can jump in there. Just, I mean, like he was saying with the moving to digital, we really have had like no kind of hiccups with moving to to being entirely remote digital work from home, to the point where we've kind of come to the conclusion of like, why didn't we do this before? You know, within the U.S. Ski and Snowboard team, we're all traveling normally all the time. You know, last year from August to about March, I was not home for more than two consecutive weeks here in Utah um, just because I travel so much for work normally. And so I don't know why it hasn't clicked with us earlier that, like, we don't need to have, you know, our butts in a chair at a desk five days a week um, to get things done because we all already travel. And so we're all already really proficient on video and email. And so this is kind of tipped us over the edge of like, we maybe need to re-examine our entire, you know, model of what it means to, to work in an office and to work for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard team. Um, unfortunately, we have a three-story office building, so it's not as easy as like, well, let's just get rid of that because um, we own it. So, um, but yeah, that's been really huge for us is just actually kind of 
I feel like stepping into the 21st century of like digital and work from home and remote is perfect for us. You know, we even did our end of season budget meetings, presentation, planning, all of that, um, all virtually, you know, with, with relatively few hiccups. So that has been just huge for us, you know, looking at budgets and how we readjust that in the future. Um, digital is going to be huge for us and virtual. Cool. Thanks, Kate. Um, so one last question, and we have some uh, questions that have been uh, submitted by attendees. Um, so what advice uh, would you give someone um, who is uh, looking to enter your career field? And um, I could start off with that, and it would be um, wear a helmet and take care of your knees, because when you're almost 50, um, those two things get real important. So that's one thing. Um, uh, so how about the rest of you? Like if you were to give someone like one little bit, like again, we all have mass amounts of experience in our field, but if you just say, uh, if you're to do one thing, do this one thing, um, what would that be? I think for the park service, the one thing to get into the career is simply like to go there and to see it. I think working in this career, a lot of people have this connection to like, um, you know, the natural public lands we have. And the more you get into it, the I think that the, no, a career kind of naturally forms off that. So with me, like, and through my experience with Todd and the wilderness program, that kind of just exposed me to a lot of places. and in realizing like, yeah, this could be a career and this could be an option. Um, but it does take a lot of, I think, getting used to being kind of uncomfortable a lot of the times. Like in the park service, you usually have to be outside and be really cold and also like move every six months. So I think just, you know, getting out there is probably the biggest thing. Like you, to be able to work in a national park, I think you need to experience a national park. Well, thanks, Brendan. Anybody else? What's the one bit of uh, advice that you would give someone interested in your career field? I would say definitely do your market research. Um, I've known a lot of people over the years who have or have had small businesses and they, they think, oh, I have this great idea. I'm just going to make it happen based upon X, Y, or Z. But they, they skip down to X, Y, and Z without starting at A, B, and C. You know, you need to find where your market is, where it market lies, uh, who's interested. And from there, go with, okay, where is your market? Is it online? Is it a physical market? And if it's a physical market, what are your rules and regulations associated with it? There's been um, quite a few people that I know in, in my industry, they're like, oh, I'm just gonna have a bed and breakfast. I'm like, okay, well, a licensed bed and breakfast is different than an Airbnb. What do you need to do? And they've actually either gotten smacked with huge fines or they folded within a couple of years because they didn't realize everything and like they did not do their research. Cool, thanks Kelly. Anybody else have any? Uh words of wisdom to pass along. Al, you just unclick, so does that mean you're your, raising your hand? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, I would say for anyone looking to break into the ski industry, um, just do it. Any opportunity that comes your way, um, if it's a part-time job, an internship, or even volunteering at the resort, um, it's a great way to meet people and network. Um, and what I've found um, throughout my whole life in the ski community, I feel like everyone's really open. Um, everyone loves being outside. So, you know, you're going to have a connection with someone. So really any opportunity to get your foot in the door to make some connections will ultimately help you um, kind of start your career path. So, um, you know, even if it's maybe not the most desirable opportunity, just doing it, um, you'll meet people and hopefully you'll make some connections, uh, lead the path for yourself. I can speak to this on the other side of my life as a, a professional kayaker and having done that for a big chunk of my life, um, my advice is marry well. Um, so, or else you'll find yourself living in your truck. Um, so I have, 
I definitely owe a lot to my wife, who's super understanding, who's cool with me being gone for big clips of time here and there. Um, but I, I think Alice is spot on that, you know, um, you know, you have to commit and you have to jump into it. And sometimes you need to do uh, the layman's work, if you will, just to um, build an experience base, meet people, connect with folks. Um, and I think that that effort is, you know, that experience like Brendan was talking about, um, it's what pays off dividends in the long run. I'm just yeah, going to, I'm not really a panelist, but I just wanted to put a plug in too, and you all alluded to this in your introductions and everything, is use your network from St. Mike's. Um, that pays dividends, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a grad that was two years older than you or 22 years ahead of you. Um, I know more people that have been successful because of their network that they built while they were at St. Mike's. And um, that's pretty unique um, in my experience outside of St. Mike's. Um, and so use it. You have a lot of connections, whether you want to be in, you know, the travel and tourism side or the adventure sports side. Wherever you want to be, there's people there that can help you. And I'll, I'll just jump in, concur with Angela, because I owe my 30 years to networking, but I've also been the host of, I don't know how many St. Mike's interns at our company over the last 20 years, probably 75 in uh, before COVID, unfortunately, but you know, those interns have gone on to become buyers at Backcountry. They've gone, gone on to work at Scott Eyewear. They've gone on and on. So yeah, there's some opportunity through the college with the different, um, from the ski snowboard side of it, there's a lot of companies there where the internship program can help. Um, unfortunately, right now, that's a little tough, but um, your network is good. And then just follow your passion. I actually worked for as a mortgage originator for about 15 minutes after I graduated and then uh, and then became a snowboard instructor. And live, living out of vehicles is cold in Franconia Notch, but you also get good days. So, so follow that passion. So we have a couple questions from attendees and uh, a number of them have to deal with um, climate change. Um, but I think folks in the ski and snowboard industry, I think this is something that is constantly on your radar screen um, is how has global climate change um, impacted your industry? Um, so general thoughts on that? Can you guys hear me now? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry, you'd be the pain in the butt. Uh, so I first wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Julianne. Everyone called me Jules. I still do. Uh, grad, 2007 grad, business major, um, marketing focus. I am currently um, the sales manager at Cannon Mountain and Franconia Notch State Park. So I have the awesome job of balancing state the national forest, uh, all that fun land, and also being a ski resort and living in that world. Um, this will be my 14th winter doing it, but prior to that, um, I was a ski racer. I didn't actually race for St. Mike's. I jumped ship um, on them and played lacrosse. Um, and, that, and then during the winter breaks, I came home, I made snow. Um, so I did a little, I've done a little bit of everything uh, in terms of winter sports. Um, but my main focus now is really just sales and marketing for Canon and the state park. Cool. And uh, so how is global climate change? I mean, you can probably speak to this. How has this impacted your industry? Uh, I mean, particularly for us up in the notch, I mean, we have our own weather system, so we adapt kind of daily to it ever changing. Um, we may kind of joke that when loon's getting rain, we're getting snow or maybe vice versa, but the industry is, as a whole has 
the technology has gone from just the simple K guns and, and just simple water and pressure and all that to really having a, a true science behind that and um, forecasting where are you going to move the guns when the wind's blowing this direction and following that whole thing. It's, it's not just let's go out and wing it. It's, there's a plan every single day at Snow Plan. We plan even a week to two weeks um, ahead, depending on the shift. And that could be a 24 hour change. We're literally going to have to sh change where we're on the mountain. Um, th I can say for a fact that uh, snowmaking is going to be the future of, of skiing, at least in the East Coast. Um, it's really scary when you don't get snow. You, you know, we get, we get made fun of for having wind and ice, but uh, it, that some days that's very true. And without snowmaking, a lot of trails may not open for the season. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I would just jump in. Um, just from what I've seen, um, working closely with the resorts for Ski Utah for the past few years, um, it's definitely really tricky. Um, you know, we're seeing seasons where, you know, kind of extremes on either end where you can get just crazy low snow totals or it's the opposite and it's just snowing all the time. So it's really hard to predict. Um, and it's hard for the marketing um, departments at the resorts to go with sometimes. Um, I know what we've seen um, some years that the season itself seems like it doesn't start until later and then it'll go longer. So sometimes it's a matter of trying to educate the consumer that, you know, spring skiing is still great. Um, you can still have a lot of fun and just because it's later in the year, you can still go. You don't have to transition just yet to other sports. Um, and then also it's a little bit of education on the other side too. Um, we're seeing that a lot of travelers are waiting to book a lot of the times and they're being very choosy with where they go. So a lot of times, um, especially with the icon or the Epic passes, you have a ton of areas to choose from. Um, so they'll wait, um, into November, December, or sometimes even just a couple weeks before their trip to before booking it. And so, um, it's really playing a big factor in terms of who's getting those travelers. It's just all dependent on weather. Like it always has been, but even more so now. I can jump in from a supplier standpoint, cause we're at the mercy of, the Cannon Mountains and the Ski Utahs, you know, their, their uh, product ultimately allows us to sell. And certainly the trend has been, I'll concur with Al, the shift, you know, when I first started in the business, you'd have a lot of business being done in August, um, physical sales, uh, August, September, October. And now what we're seeing is, is things are pushing back. I think as we see, um, spring or I should say summer transitioning to fall you see things like the bike industry selling much later people riding with night lights those people that like to be out so what's happening is is those retailers are keeping summer products um, longer and that transitions winter products in longer so sort of the start of the season where it used to be Labor Day now and then a transition to more like Columbus Day, we're actually seeing that push up now into November. And we're seeing our business really, really compress between um, Thanksgiving, Christmas obviously being there, but we also have seen trends because of what Al noted, winters seem to be pushing back later. The product that the are putting out there, that's actually the best time to go. And it seems like that word is getting through to the consumer. So we're able to see now prices being held all the way through to March, which for our business, that's important. If everybody goes on sale on January 1st, then uh, retailers can't make money. So I think uh, sort of a shifting of the traditional landscape is there. And again, that goes to the little side of things. Digital is, um, everybody wants immediate gratification. So when they wanna buy a snowboard, they buy it today, they want it tomorrow and they want to use it in Utah on a powder day the next day, so. I think, um, I think just across the board, working in tourism and, or outdoor pursuits and adventure sport, uh, snow sports, um, flexibility and then unpredictability is kind of being able to 
respond um, and in a dynamic way is is critical. And uh, just in my work, I've looked at helping people do models around programming uh, for more broad adventure-based programs. And obviously, one of the places, ironically, that I look at and I get a lot of information from is Scotland, because Scotland's been dealing with unpredictable weather their entire life. And because it's a it's a rock in the middle of the sea. So you can have an alpine environment with avalanche conditions. And then three days later, you're rock climbing or whitewater kayaking. And so looking at how businesses there and their outdoor centers um, kind of schedule programming, how they roll over equipment, how they do staffing, all of their staffing are multiple discipline folks so that they can uh, be pulled off a mountain program and they can get them off the hill and, and put them on the sea um, just to respond to you know, changes in the weather. Um, so yeah, they've, they've dealt with that their entire existence. And so it is a, it's kind of a unique, a unique thing that we're having to deal with for the first time. And in the arc of 25 years, um, like when people talk about backcountry skiing, I usually have them pick three weekends, uh, in the winter season, um, a go weekend and then two maybes just so that, um, if they're going to travel to Vermont for that because of unpredictability. Um, so we have a couple questions and we're going to stay in, a, in this group. Um, so for folks that are working uh, in the ski industry and or have connections with ski resorts, uh, what are some plans that you've seen out there for um, preventing the spread of COVID-19 while still getting resorts to open and do that in a sensible way? And I think we've all seen um, Vail's plan and then some of the other plans that have been put out, but what are some other folks impact uh, input on that? Oh, this one is all you buddy. <laughs> I was gonna say. Um, yeah, um, it has been a tricky summer um, to say the least, not knowing if we were gonna have a winter, what it was gonna look like. Um, so, I think it's safe to say we're all in our office happy when Vail Resorts came out with their plan. Um, that It's giving us a little bit of direction. And in the past few weeks, we've seen other resorts slowly announce their plans as well. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Vail Resorts is looking to operate a reservation system um, so that they can monitor and maintain the number of skiers that attend their, or show up at their resorts um, so that they can maintain that skier visit uh, number that they're supposed to work with. Um, and then I know that other resorts are looking more so into limiting their skier visits by parking, um, by how many pace, uh, spaces that they have. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but I know also they're looking at changing the overall experience that guests are going to get um, so that they make sure that they feel safe. So we're going to see um, differences in the lift lines. Um, I've heard um, that some resorts are going to space out um, and have almost a ghost lane in between where skiers are going to wait before they get called out. Um, uh, additionally, they're going to make more outdoor seating available and also take out food available. So um, I'm sure we're going to see much more um, this winter just different changes to what we're used to in terms of skiing. And I imagine that they're gonna change on the fly throughout the season when, you know, they're gonna learn a ton um, this year in terms of how the experiences are going, how their protocols are performing. And um, yeah, just trying to overall, just give the best experience that they can, keeping everyone safe, but still giving a good ski experience. I think a new generation will get exposed to having to boot up in the car. Um, and, uh, you know, access the mountain that way without doing it in a nice warm space, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, so that's good. Anybody else that's working in the industry or near the industry have input on how folks are adapting to open s safely and sustainably? Well, from, from somebody who has, um, we, I am not anywhere near a skate area. I'll just put it out that way. But from the resort standpoint of, opening up your doors so people will stay overnight. We here in Maine have, and it does go state by state. In some states, it goes county by county, what your regulations are. Uh, here in Maine, we have been encouraged to go down to 50% room occupancy. So where you used to have, you know, 100 rooms available, you now only have 50. 
and you have to let those rooms sit for a certain amount of time before you clean them as is recommended. Um, but what we have found though is that there are people who are in tight financial distress, shall we say, and they have let this go out the window. They're like, okay, just come. Come, we don't, we're not going to check your COVID tests. Some states, as does Maine, we require a COVID test for anybody coming from outside of New England. And that has really uh, affected our numbers, so to speak. Um, but you also have people who own Airbnbs that they don't, they're not, I don't know what they're doing per se. My people that I know have Airbnbs, they go by strict cleaning, they go with the every other day, they go with 50% occupancy, but there are some places out there that it's okay, am I going to go bankrupt because I don't have my people, so therefore I'm going to get as many people in here as possible. Um, just so I can stay afloat and I'm going to cross my fingers and hope for the best that everybody is safe and sound. So from somebody who has a, not an active, you know, side of let's keep our lines distance and from ghost lanes, which is a great idea, by the way, but um, from the flip side of the accommodations, it's, it's a struggle. It really is because the more people you have that come in, the more money you have to work with. And it's, it's a balancing act. I think that's an interesting point in that, and this, the interconnectedness of everything that we do, because um, I, this summer, I've done a bit of work over in Maine on the sea, doing some co uh, birch canoe coaching courses. And one of the challenge, there's no, there's no, um, there's no lack of people that want to come and take that course. But then when I start asking, where are you from? Have you did a COVID test? And, and having to tell people no, or just not being able to find them accommodation, um, it is a challenge. So yeah, I think that's, and it's something that we're going to have to navigate. Um, we're just going to have to keep navigating in the short term. Um, so that's it for the formal questions. Uh, Jacob recommended opening it up to the group um, to see if there's any questions from folks. Um, specifically. I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, you know, we saw such, and of course we're in Vermont, so we saw so many people getting outside. People that you never saw walking in your neighborhoods or on your roads or wherever you live, bikes, you couldn't find a bike to buy by the middle of July for a kid. Um, and so people have taken some of this time to either get healthier or do things with their family and the only options they had were like outside. Um, and do you think it's sustainable? Do you think they'll sustain this? Because that's a real, that's a great benefit of COVID if it's sustainable. And I'm curious for those of you in the industry who see sort of the rise and fall of um, people's attitudes toward things, do you think it will be sustainable? I can speak um, this a little bit from, you know, uh, oh. <laughs> it's a hot question. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I can speak to this from a paddle sports side. I know, um, after the uh, recession in 2008, um, you know, in the paddle sports industry, we really braced ourselves for impact. And then um, our sales went through the roof and it was from folks saying, hey, I have X number of dollars to spend. I'm going to buy something. I'm going to buy a piece, of a, a piece of equipment or I'm going to buy into a lifestyle that I've, I can enjoy over many, many, many days versus going on a trip or a, an expensive vacation. So they, they were still spending those dollars, but they were spending them differently. And then that eventually kind of, as the economy recovered, it kind of flattened out. And I think Dan was speaking to this also, um, talking about like, and you mentioned it, uh, you know, mountain bike sales, like you, good luck trying to find, you can, you can bring all of your money to the store, but there's no, I was in the ski rack and there was one carbon fiber, you know, Santa Cruz bike left one, like usually there's like a 
half dozen of the you know ten thousand dollar super bikes and there was one left um and so and it was a small which no one's going to buy um but i think that's a i i, I know from the paddle sports side you know Piranha p and H's warehouse in Tennessee is empty right now. We're waiting for containers to come over from the U UK um, to stock. But I think that, um, so I'm, I, how sustainable is how long it lasts? I guess that's, you know, more to come on that. But um, yeah, folks are, you know, they are getting outside. They're engaging in activities that they can engage in, so. Um, I, I think uh, once we get, sorry, do you want to go? I think from, a, a, I think everyone wanted to get outside, do something, they were cooped up. Um, I actually got sent down to our, our campground because they, we couldn't sell our tram, we couldn't send people to the flume, we couldn't send them to the beach, we couldn't do any of that stuff. Um, so I think people were ready to get out and do things and, and I think once normalcy starts to come back into play, I, I think people will go back to their regular routines. We're kind of creatures of habit. And um, once it levels out, I think you'll find people going back to the movies instead of taking their kids for a walk. I think you'll find, you know, that the, the bikes will get a little bit dusty. They're, you know, they'll do things that were more comfort food, if you will, than getting outside. It's been great. I mean, if you are working at a campground, we're nonstop busy because um, people feel it's safer than going and staying in hotels. Um, but I do think that will shift back to the other direction once things level out. Kate. Hey. What's your input? Everybody's been cutting you off, not intentionally. It's just a Zoom no, thing. No, 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 no. Um, it's the Minnesotan in me. I'm always like, no, 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 you go. Um, <laughs> so, you know, from a, from a ski and snowboard perspective, at least at like the national team level, yes, we oversee the national team, but, you know, we also have stewardship over 30,000, you know, recreational members across the U.S. And we are really hoping um, although I would tend to agree with you, Jules, that um, people will probably go back to their old habits. We're really hoping they don't. Um, we are actively kind of trying to capitalize on this new interest from a lot of people in being outdoors and picking up new sports that hopefully we can bring, you know, new demographics into skiing and snowboarding. Um, you know, I don't think it's a secret to anyone here that it's viewed as a, as a rich white sport. Um, and that is something we, you know, have been actively trying to combat anyways. And so we are really working hard. We have several kind of focus groups, at least within our organization, looking at, you know, how do we jump on this, this interest in people picking up new outdoor hobbies and how do we, um, you know, use that to hopefully also change the perception of skiing and snowboarding, um, you know, as this kind of affluent, hard to get into sport. So it's something that, yeah, I think people will go back to their old habits, but hopefully we can at least capture the interest um, for longer than, you know, however long COVID lasts, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. I'll just make a quick comment. I think a dad of four girls as well, I think a lot of people are trying to find things to do with the kids and family, right? Because they've been digital. So when they're in your hair, you're trying to do things. So, you know, we had a nice shiny new mountain bike that we were able to find and, uh, you know, to get out there. So it, it is nice to have the time to introduce that. And I walk both sides of it because I'm also the president of our local um, youth soccer program. So, you know, team sports is, is uh, something that is really preyed on ski and snowboard industry because we a lot of times it's vacations and a family thing that you can do together um, unlike a lot of other sports you can actually go and you know you can mountain bike together you can ski together um, you can snowboard together so that end of it the hope this winter is is we'll see that especially with a lot of school systems being um, you know one or two days a week the sustainability side of it, you know, I, I would agree that we'll probably see a downtick. However, 
The one part about these sports is they're darn fun. You know, if you do go out and experience snowboarding and you have that again, hopefully the parents are the ones, the lapsed skiers, the lapsed snowboarders that have been raising kids are out there. Um, and I know the resort side of the industry has done a tremendously good job of getting um, beginners back into it or lapsed people back into it. So I think, you know, I think we're going to see some, we're going to see some trends continue here on the outside. And I think just to add one last point from the ski snowboard side of it, we are lucky because, well, especially in Vermont, I always wear a mask because it's a hundred below zero wind chill factor, especially over at Canyon there, it's cold. So masks, we're, we're just playing into something, gloves, masks, people already do it. So, but Todd, yeah, they're going to have to learn to boot up and not go into the warm lodge and do all of that. But I think, uh, you know, I'm optimistic for our industry that we'll see some, um, you know, some action this winter. And, and hopefully, Angela, we do. I, let's hope that people don't buy a $5,000 mountain bike and see the dust on it the following year, especially when it has a motor on, when it's electric, too. <laughs> Any other questions from the group? I, I had a similar question for the people that are in like the, the hotel and the events industry side of things. Like, what is the, the bounce back for you going to be? Like, and Matt is, you know, supposed to be planning events as do our staff people. Like, what does that look like? And when is it safe to travel? Because I really need to go somewhere outside of Vermont for five minutes. <laughs> so I, I, I bet it. Well, as I mentioned before, we've been really hit hard with the um, with various rules and regulations. Um, to give you an idea. Uh, the first year that I opened, I had 35% occupancy. Now, granted, I'm a small bed and breakfast. I only have four rooms. The past two years, I've had 78% occupancy. This summer, I've had 12. So that's a lot to bounce back from. But however, um, we do see, as everybody knows, people want to travel. They want to get back out there. So... Um, I see a lot of people saving their money now. They, they, instead of taking the big, huge vacation because they can't take it, they'll buy the, the mountain bikes, they'll buy the snowboards, they'll save the money. And then next year, it's like, bam, hopefully next year, you know, bam, I'm going to go for a week here. I'm going to go for a week there. And they're going to need places to stay. So if we can survive this, if the little guy especially, because I don't have a corporate name to stand behind, so if the little guy can survive this on whatever level that you are a small independent we will bounce back just because people want to travel we want we're, we're tired of our little rooms <laughs> i want to go someplace too <laughs> so so i don't i don't have any huge um fear uh mm -hmm. personally um but like i said i have known other people um, that have uh, they've already closed. They've closed doors. They're not bouncing back from this um, either. They weren't well equipped. They weren't um, diversified. They didn't have a second job, um, or it was just time for them to retire. So I think, like I said, if you can survive, you will bounce back. Well, one thing I found interesting, well, and I don't work for hotels, but I work in campgrounds and like near hotels all the time is that this had a huge effect on seasonal workers where a lot of my friends who are guides or um, boatmen or river guides that work in the hotels, they essentially were told they can't work for about eight months. And just now they're beginning to come back to work and start guiding trips again. Um, but in Arizona, it was interesting because it seemed like we had a very different response than Vermont, um, where instead of you know shutting things down, um, the, we essentially, as, as Arizona State, ignored everything and the workers were uh, trying to, you know, be as safe as possible, but all the visitors, like, got to a national park like Grand Canyon and it kind of has this illusion of it being a open 
safe space, but it's not because everyone's getting funneled into these like three viewpoints. So I think to answer your question, like, is it safe to travel? Like I say, I say, no, it's not safe to travel at all, but uh, people are still going to do it. And it'll be interesting to see from a like seasonal worker standpoint, like what's going to happen in the next couple of years, like not only with people who can't guide, but also a lot of people who bounce back and forth between seasonal jobs, like doing a guided position and then being a ski instructor or ski patrol. So it'll be interesting to see. Cool, so that is um, our time. Uh, Jacob, do you have anything you wanted to uh, chime in with as we close the meeting? Yeah, I just want to say again, thank you all for coming and joining us today, um, especially our panelists for jumping in and giving us some really great insider access to um, what's been going on in these different industries and especially for Jules for persevering through our tech problems. We're glad we got to hear <laughs> from you. Um, so thanks for keeping going with that as well. Um, and like I mentioned, we have a full week of events going on as well. So feel free to tune in for any of those future events. And of course, a special thanks for Todd for leading this discussion. Um, this wouldn't have been what it was without you. So thanks Thank again you. for everyone who helped out. Thanks everybody. Nice to see all team. of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Bye folks. Bye. 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 Bye.